Okay, so we've gone through gains in fluid or water and, and losses. And if you've done the math, you'll recognize that there's a little bit of an imbalance. And so those differences in gains and losses, if they're not regulated, this equals an imbalance, which is right where we left off. So if it's not regulated, we have imbalance. Losses total about a thousand milliliters, whereas the gains typically are right around 2,500 milliliters. And again, this is an individual who's at rest, has no pathophysiological issues that they're, that they're dealing with. So that's a really a, a difference of 1,500 milliliters. And whether or not you'll remember what I said at the very end of class on Monday is if you don't regulate this and you keep that 1,500 milliliters, every day you're just going to go up. Which is kind of not really that far away from the tree. So, what do we actually do to balance out that 1,500 milliliters? This is where finally the urinary system comes in and begins to regulate that difference. So your kidneys interact with the bloodstream, produce a material called urine to balance out the intake and output differences. So their normal metabolic activity at rest Kidneys produce fifteen hundred milliliters per day. Now, again, understanding that this is at rest, this is under normal physiological circumstances, all of these things. This normal fifteen hundred milliliters per day is actually highly adjustable. So we have highly adjustable output from our kidneys. And the range of outputs, it would appear that a minimum urine production on a daily basis is roughly about one third of what it normally is, so about 1,500 milliliters. And most of that 1,500 milliliters is dedicated to the removal of metabolic toxins that if they were allowed, if they were allowed to build up, would result in severe uh, severe complications for the individual. On the upper end, we can produce an upward of one liter of urine in an hour. Now, obviously, you don't maintain that for full long periods of time, but to put it on the day scale, that's 24 liters, or rate of 24 liters a day. So you take one of your big nausea bottles and one of your Idiot friends decides to challenge you and say, I'm going to give you a two bottle for 15 minutes. You know, and you do it, you're going to probably generate close to a liter of urine in an hour to help prevent yourself from going into what we call hypoventrania, uh, delusional hypoventrania, which is a condition where you have so much water in your bloodstream, it disrupts uh, sodium levels. Sodium is critical to physiological function and actually can even lead to death. Uh, only summer we can typically have one of the three football players, but the football players who die which can stay further from large consumptions of water after exertion of So how do I know that if you don't adjust the removal of fluid from your tissue with a high level, you're not putting the fluid below you don't have any idea. For your fun time weekend activity, go on Google and carefully search for elephantiasis. <laughs> what you're going to find is you're going to find 
pictures of individuals that their limbs and other parts of their bodies that look like elephant appendages. So they call it elephantiasis. And what it happens in elephantiasis, there's a worm, it's a little parasitic worm, and it actually ends up blocking the lymphatic system, which is one of the places where we get excessive drainage out of our tissue. So if we can't get rid of excessive fluid, the limbs blow up, and they literally look like the limbs are not. If it happened because your whole urinary system shut down, first you're never going to get to that point where you blow up like that. Is it for Rika? Charlie and Chocolate back in the clothes are playing in the You're never going to get to that point because it's going to disrupt potassium and sodium levels. You're actually going to have a heart attack before you get to this huge. <laughs> Moving on. The reason that we have to produce urine is because it removes and regulates waste and solutes in the bloodstream. So just to keep you along here, two is kidney, A, the gatekeeper of water. One, right before this two here, is regulate the water gains and loss. So as the gatekeeper of water, the kidneys also remove and regulate wastes and solids. And this removal and regulation of those wastes and solutes is water dependent. So water drives the removal. <coughs> so water has to be removed from the bloodstream by the kidney to generate this material that we call urine. And as it flows out, the water that builds up in that urine is what actually is pulling or stimulating or curing the removal of waste products. Nitrogenous waste from the breakdown of protein, excess solutes. So the urine as it's formed becomes a vehicle for disposal. So the question can be asked, well what if there's no urine? If there's no urine, that means that you're going to have increased waste in the body. We're not driving water into the urine, pulling those solutes and those waste products with it, so the waste products begin to build up. And we don't want that, right? Because it would be like this garbage can, if it never, if it never came in and emptied this garbage can, pretty soon it would be this mound of old banana peels and Starbucks cups and, and other less than savory items. Just building up in the room. When you walk in, you go, oh. So we don't want to have that environment occur inside of the body either because it's not just, uh, it's disease. And that disease can even lead on to death. And in fact, People who die from natural causes typically are dying because their kidneys have shut down, which allows things like potassium to be unregulated. Potassium is very important in the function of the heart. And if you disrupt potassium levels and they build up in the extracellular fluid, eventually the heart no longer beats. You no longer circulate blood to the brain and oxygen to the brain. Go through a process called asphyxiation. And when the brain doesn't have the right nutrient and oxygen supply, light is no longer used. By the way, does anyone know what uh, one of the most common chemicals that they use for making the injection? Just simply potassium. 
to an overrun the kidneys, load up the extracellular fluid with potassium that causes the heart to shut down, stop circulating the brain. So if we look at those chemicals and waste products and other materials that are excreted in the urine alongside of the water, we collectively call all of those materials, we call those metabolites. Now, I'm sure that you have all had the joy of going to the doctor for your urethra. They come in and nurse that stuff, that little cup. George now says, let's go into the bathroom and pee in this cup and then put it in the little container. That so, what are they doing? Well, they're actually going to assay that sample, that urine sample, if I find it like a zebra point. I'm the like worst patient ever. Physiologists are the worst patients. They're the absolute worst patients. Are you sure about that, Doctor? Are you sure about that? Are you sure you want to this guy? So they're measuring your metabolites. They're looking for not only what's there, but how much of it's there. And the most common of these metabolites is a metabolite called urea. Urea is a nitrogen containing compound, and every time you break down protein, you produce another chemical called ammonia. And ammonia is super toxic, but it can actually be extremely in the urine. So we actually have to neutralize this toxic. We do that in the liver. And as we process ammonia in the liver, the biochemical end product is urea, which can be excreted in the liver. Urea is still toxic, but we actually have a mechanism to get rid of that toxic nitrogen containing compound. So we have this metabolic pathway that leads to the production of ammonia as we break down proteins. That's a very toxic compound. So initially we convert it to the less toxic, still toxic, but less toxic molecule called urea. This happens in the liver. So ammonia is going to be delivered to the liver through the bloodstream neutralized to urea in the liver, released back into the bloodstream, circulates to the kidney, gets deposited into the urine, and eventually makes its way into your local sanitary sewer. That's the original case, true the form of saying that you can So you get rid of the urea. So if we measure the assay for molecules in urine, this is one of them that you're actually going to find. Uh, next time you go and get physical done and get you to lab report, you'll see your metabolites on them. There's like actually a bunch of them, and you should be able to find urea. They're also going to measure for your ions. By the way, why do we why do we use urine? They use blood, obviously, as well. Well, it's a waste product, so it can go mature at this point. Well, for example, if you have like enough ions coming out, that you will be your body's functioning right. Yes. In urine, because it's relatively consistent, I don't have to cut anything open. I don't have to even poke myself with a needle, which some people don't really like. So we can get a lot of information and correlate. Okay, if you have this amount of this ion. This is what we expect in the exercise of the fluid. This is what we would expect in the intracellular of the fluid. And as long as you're within a range, you're good to go. 
So they also are going to measure things like ions. Every time you consume a meal, ions enter from your diet. And there is no way around that unless you just decide to only eat literally a bag of sugar, which even when it's not that pure, it's going to have ions in it. But every time you consume any food source, you're consuming that or four organisms' ions. So you seal those ions and they begin to build up in your bloodstream too. The most critical are sodium and chloride and they come from a chemical called sodium chloride which is table salt. Now if you'll remember I drew a figure at one point. Extracellular fluid, intracellular fluid. Sodium levels are real high outside, sodium levels are real low inside, sits up by potential, concentration gradients, and everything. So you consume in your diet, that was like salty fries from Chick fil A. We're going to get a connection. Chick fil A. <laughs> so sodium comes in, and eventually it's deposited into the bloodstream from the digestive system, moves into the extracellular fluid to help maintain these levels here. And we don't want them to be super high. We don't want them to be super low. This is all about homeostasis. We want to maintain them at a nice, normal, physiological level. So when you go and eat those real salty fries, you're probably getting far more sodium than you need. And we want to get rid of some of that, and so it comes out in comes out in the urine. So some of it ends up in the extracellular fluid. It also has profound effects on the blood itself. It will help to regulate an individual's blood pressure. If you or someone you love has high blood pressure, you probably know that they're on a low sodium diet because of those profound effects that are on blood pressure. <coughs> we also regulate other ions, including potassium, the hydrogen proton, and calcium. In addition to the sodium, these are very important in systems that follow some sort of electrical activity physiology or electrophysiology, things like the nervous system, the heart, the cell, the digestive system, really just about any system that we have has some sort of need for these ions in order to function. And we want to again make sure that we maintain those ions coming in from your diet. We want to make sure we balance them out so we don't get high levels of potassium because there's already established levels of potassium that come in. Also important in acid base balance, humans typically function between a pH of 6 and 8. So, right at neutral 7 and on either side, a little alkaline, a little acidic. Remember, hydrogen, as you increase the concentration of the hydrogen proton, you decrease pH, meaning you become more acidic. So, in the end, if we don't regulate things like hydrogen and get rid of excess hydrogen, or hold back hydrogen from being excreted in the nervous system, we can drastically affect our pH. And changes in pH are not very tolerable for humans. If we're outside of a pH range of 6 to 8, you don't feel very good. The proteins begin to denature that you get the dysfunction, and that dysfunction really is not very much fun. Another metabolite that we're going to find are what are called trace elements. And trace elements, they're, they're called trace because they're in very low amounts. There's just a trace of these elements, or should be normally. Um, and so we, we can measure these trace elements and they can tell us a little bit about functions inside of the body. Again, a very out of way to evaluate some function.
there's a trace element called creatinine, and creatinine is a byproduct of the creatine phosphate energy system. So if your creatine phosphate system is working well, you should only have small amounts of creatinine. Uh, if you have problems with uh, the heart, creatine and creatinine actually can change levels with their myocardial and heart or during a heart attack. The other thing creatinine can tell us is we know about how much creatinine should be generated in a 24-hour time period. This can also be used to measure the effectiveness of your kidneys. And they do a test called the creatinine clearance test. And you only really get this if they suspect that your kidneys are may not be working very well or if they want to keep track of kidney function. And they give you a nice jar called a urinal. And it's pretty big and for 24 hours you collect everything. You have that big old jar that you at the hospital and they go through and they measure how polluted or how concentrated creatinine levels are in that. Another trace element is albumin. Albumin is actually a protein. It should be really, really low. Kidneys should not be generating large quantities of urine with large amounts of protein. Unless you're supplementing the protein, then you're going to find larger quantities of protein in your diet. The last trace element are pigments. And one of the most profound pigments, or the most prolific pigments, I should say, in urine is a yellow pigment. And now you understand how you know that you're turning mostly Yeah, it's very possible. Um, you do. Protein supplements are very similar to you. I don't know if any They carry the bag around and come out and they have a big shark of protein. Go to a thing of protein right now from GNC or or I think the gallon drives to about 67 to 70 bucks. And you don't need that much protein. Even people who are weightlifting, when I'm weightlifting, you actually need less protein than customers buy. Because you're not actually you're not actually utilizing the protein for a for a <coughs> source. You're not using it to produce energy. You're breaking it down, you're not getting rid of it. And it will be built back up. You can go and have a cup of Greek yogurt or Peanut butter, jelly sandwich, the peanut butter will have lots of protein, egg whites, of protein in egg whites, and you get a, a significant supply of protein from those actual food sources that you don't even need to sell. People who I make fun of people who will go and buy their food chain of protein and they say, just if you're making expensive. Because almost 99% of it is just extremely dirty, just like in the vitamin pill. You're just inundating the body with nutrients that you can't use. The human body was designed for a high level of efficiency. Obviously, you've got high level of efficiency in the protected body. Same things like that, so high as efficient as it used to be. But you don't need, you don't need a whole lot of protein. Vitamin supplements, low amounts, maybe okay. Uh, high amounts, certainly okay. You're just, you're probably being critical of it. The other thing, too, that maybe have to keep, and I'm not trying to bad mouth your nutritionist or your vitamin plan or anything like that, but you 
very careful with like this, you know, places like this and other places because they're not very good. And they have done studies where a lot of these things are coming out of China. And they come out of China with heavy metals in them or other things that are really bad for you. And the yellow, yellow may not be because you're getting rid of a large number of nutrients. The yellow may be because you're getting rid of all kinds of stuff. So you're flushing out as much of the stuff for bad for you as possible. Any of them deep, it used to be put in a lot, you still can get it. Um, typically, it's really low concentration. It used to be on 100% wheat, and it worked exceptionally well if you were in the woods around your own in June or July, and you see those stuff. Um, so, like, really scary, right? But you put on some deep, and like, you have like this. Ring of protection around you with these seals, like don't even come anywhere near you. If you use a lot of deep, you're out hunting or fishing or whatever, you you keep passing. It's because your body's like, oh my gosh, this is so toxic, I gotta get rid of it. Anyways, moving on. I don't know if I answered the question. I probably need a lot of collaborating on more than three weeks ago. It was a good route to try to get it. I would prefer that it be based off of some sort of solid scientific evidence. Nutritional supplements, um, and it's not necessarily so much that it's the vitamins and the minerals, it's a lot of the other things that are in the herbs and things like that. If you're just taking like a centra that is just vitamins, you have some iron in there, and vitamin A, and vitamin B, and vitamin C, and not ginkgo uh, biloba and all of those other like, herbaceous materials. None of those are ready. They are not covered by the FDA. Um, what was that one? Yeah. I mean, and some of the stuff, too, it's probably not bad for humans. I'm not saying that. But some of it, we have no idea. We have absolutely no, no clue whatsoever. And we put a lot of stuff in these things, metal allergy. Which is a, an amino acid. It is actually something that you do need to consume in your diet. You may get exposed to really high levels of phenylalanine, uh, and another one is aspartame. You get exposed to high levels of phenylalanine and aspartame from diet colas, and you're at much higher risk for cancer. Now, I'm not saying oh, don't ever have a diet cola or drink, drink one and have cancer. I'm not saying that, but there's a lot of people who drink diet cola three or four times a day. And that would be useful for the copyrights. So I think that it just is one of those things that you have to, you want to be a, a, a well informed consumer <coughs> and understand what, what is the basic direction to do. Is there any scientific evidence? I mean, you can go on that list of things and you can go into a search engine and you can type some of those things and you can find the same resources. But let me clarify. I don't speak for it in this regard. I am I'm really a purist when it comes to consumption of foods and things like that. I don't ever supplement them with vitamins or anything like that. There are some good evidences that probably when I get a little bit older, about four more years, I'll be 40, and I might want to add something like half a baby aspirin to help regulate the, the thickness and thickness of my blood. Because there's good scientific evidence that indicates that that increases the likelihood of some heart attack than eventually it's called. Yeah. Um, or adding, well, I mean, even vitamin D. You don't really know how much vitamin D individual needs. Most of the time you get vitamin D from exposure to the sun. And we started using sunscreens and we now have things like SPF 50, which has been really great for reducing cancer, but it's affected vitamin D production. And even though we don't know much about vitamin D production, we now understand that some vitamin D production is actually really important. It helps out with things like uh, new motivation, or wakefulness, um, 
So some some physicians will recommend going on vitamin D, but you've got to come and cut the vitamin D with uh, extra calcium as well because it's needed to help absorb the vitamin D. It's a world that there's all. I mean, we have whole stores, inceptions of stores that are dedicated to, to sell products that are different. Make you grow a foot taller, make you become more beautiful, make you become, I mean, that, like everything under the sun, right? And a lot of it is all of this. As a PhD student, um, I worked a little bit on projects that evaluate websites for exercise and nutrition that looks for what we call the true-ish and false. The things that were sounded sort of true and the things that were really, really false. And I remember in particular, there was one website. It was a company that was selling a sports drink, like a Gatorade, but it said, uses human glucose. And I'm like, what is human glucose? Because glucose is glucose, and it doesn't matter if it comes from an organism, like an uh, animal, like a steak, or an apple. Glucose is a chemical compound. And it does not differentiate between organisms. Well, what human glucose meant to them is they had a whole system where people were providing uh, urine samples for them. They were extracting the glucose from the urine, purifying it, holding it in a cup, putting it in their sports drink because it was human glucose. And so, I mean, that's what I'm talking about, just things like that. Because they thought that there's a lot of people. I'm not saying any of them are here true, but in athletic programs that are looking for that much. And if you can if you can take the smallest the smallest thing and skew it just a little bit, it may be a lemon. Blood doping has been huge in endurance athletics, especially in tour style cycling. Blood doping is one of the, the the most egregious things that you can do to your, to your cardiovascular system. Take off blood, it puts back in. It is literally the equivalent to taking the engine of your car, which may require something like 5W30 water oil, which is pretty business, but put it in your 90 way gear oil. It's not going to run too efficiently. In fact, it's probably going to kill the motor, right? But it was huge back in the 90s in particular. And there's a bunch of people who did really, really well in cycling with us, and then they died because they have heart attacks at 36 years old. Sorry. No, it's all right. I enjoy it. I don't do that. <laughs> Any other great rabbit trails to chase this morning? So we're going to shift gears here, and we're going to now talk about the anatomy of filtration. Filtration is the starting point for urine production, and we have to understand what the urinary system is in order to understand how urine is going to be produced. And really, in one gigantic summary statement, the urinary system. is simply just a big filtering device. And if you really think about it, a filter, coffee filter, you've got your grounds on one side, you push water through it, you pull some stuff, leave some stuff behind. The urinary system is going to act just the same way. You're going to have water on one side, material on that side, it's going to pull the water and the material through, it's going to leave other stuff on the circular, circulation side. Anatomically, the urinary system is made up of four main organs. And those four main organs, we've seen them before, here they are again, two kidneys. Leading from those kidneys, you have these long tubes called the ureters or the ureters, a urinary bladder, which is a storage depot for urine, and then you have the urethra, which is the tube that leads all through the external genitalia to tree ureters.
we're going to start out with the kidneys, and what we'll do here is we'll actually take the kidney and we're going to, we're going to go right through it. It's like a cross section. We're going to look at the detail. We're going to look at the internal, what I'm going to call macro and microanatomy of the kidney, so that we can really see how urine is going to be produced or how we begin to produce urine. So the kidneys are designed uniquely to excrete metabolites. As a second function, the kidney also has tissue and cells that produce hormones. And so the kidneys also act as endocrine glands. Now, does anyone remember <coughs> during the beginning? <coughs> During the beginning of this uh, conversation, what is the urinary system actually regulating from a homeostatic, homeostatic perspective? It's regulating the characteristics of the blood. So we're going to filter the blood, we're going to get rid of the stuff that we don't want there, that we need to get rid of, and we're going to maintain or keep in the stuff that we want to maintain in the blood. We also have endocrine function. And the endocrine function of the kidney is actually also going to regulate the blood as well. In fact, the signal to generate new red blood cells or more red blood cells initiates from the kidney a protein called EPL or erythropoietin. We also release hormones from the kidney or the kidney is involved in the regulatory hormonal pathway that helps to regulate blood pressure as well. So even its secondary endocrine function is to regulate the blood. Now as far as I know, only one student here has ever seen the kidney of a mouse. And what does that kidney look like? And it looks like a kidney bean. So they literally, you open up, you open up the kidney, you see one there? Basically bisector? No, I oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have a whole lab because basement. That's preserved specimens or not. Okay. Yeah, that's the size of the question. But <laughs> and when, when you talk about like dissecting the animals and things like that, especially when you do it, well, I mean, you were just think about it as a surgery that went really bad. <laughs> we don't ever, we don't ever kill animals. We just, we just harvest their organs, and we don't ever. <laughs> it's a, a, a whole lot. I don't hunt. I have to harvest. <laughs> All right, so yes, it is a bean shaped organ. And that bean shaped organ has lots of micro anatomy. Now, real quick micro anatomy. Anatomy. Literally, what anatomy means is it means to pull apart or to cut apart. Microanatomy is going to be to cut apart the really small. In other words, to really understand the kidney and the kidney function, you have to look at it uh, under microscopy. You have to look at it very, very small detail. So there's lots of microanatomy. Some of it you, you can see with the naked eye, and they kind of show you some of the structures here. But if we were to zoom in, and we will, um, one of these small little pyramidal structures, that's actually where everything happens. And literally, what you can't see here, but what we're going to come to, is there are about a million, in each kidney, a million little tube-like structures that help to begin to filter the blood. 
So we're going to look at that microanatomy. And there is a lot of microanatomy inside of the The tubes that lead away from the kidney, um, they're ureters. They also sometimes get called ureters. Whatever the case, these are just simply tubes that carry the urine to the blood from the kidney. Tubes leading away from the kidney and they carry the urine. And they, they basically are going to, on the kidney side of the tube, pick up and collect the urine that's being formed and being modified. Once it makes it into the ureter, it's not going to be changed anymore. This is urine in its final form and it goes and is collected in the urinary bladder. And when you come back on Monday, we'll talk about the urinary bladder and its storage capacity.